Okay, a very good morning to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ here at Bethany EFC. And 各位弟兄姐妹们平安 I'm very thankful that once again I can be in your midst, even though today most of us are all online. But we're learning at His feet once again, and as I understand, this is the last sermon, a part of a four-part sermon series on Haggai chapter.、Uh, well, today I'm going to speak on Haggai chapter two, verses twenty to twenty-three. And but just before we dive into today's passage, I wanted to ask all of you a question. And this is a question that, as a pastor, I ask my members very often. The question is this: How are you? You know, how are you today? How are you lately? You 最近怎么样 Now this is a question a lot of us are、uh, uh, the 标准答案 the proper answer that we usually say is fine, thank you. How about yourself? But so recently, you know, I asked my pastors, my church leaders, how are all of you? And I was a little bit taken aback when one of them actually took me by surprise with her answer. She replied, "I'm not okay." She says, "I thought I would be. You know, I know what we should be doing, but you know, during this time, you know, after so many months months of mask on, mask off, come to church, stay online, it's just been so tiring. It's been so discouraging to plan, only for our plans to be cancelled, delayed, or just、uh, really confused over this period of time. Now, I believe that not just this sister in Christ is feeling that like that." I believe many of us perhaps are also feeling sometimes that we're not so okay during this time, you know. Especially not just those in church leadership, but many of us even in our workplace, in our families, in our schools, we seem to know we should we know what we should be feeling. In fact, we know as Christians we should persevere, we should carry on church no matter whether it's online or offline. But you know, we can't help but sometimes feel a little discouraged. Feel tired, or sometimes not. Don't feel as steady as we want to be. In fact, a local study recently told us、um, that in Singapore, among the Christians, about 95 percent of us all feel. You know what? We prefer on-site worship. Most of them said when this pandemic is over, they would very much want to come back to church. We know that that's the right way to have fellowship with one another. Only about five percent said they will stay online. So we know that you know whether or not we are online or offline. Though during this unique season in our life, we should persevere. We should not lose hope. But sometimes we can't help but have what we know and what we feel have this great divide, right? Sometimes what we know to be right, to be true, to be good, is not exactly how we feel inside. Especially perhaps over the past a year, a lot of us have been having this struggle. Perhaps some of you even here in Bethany, especially for those of you who grew up here or have been here for so many years, maybe you, deep down inside you feel like you know what the church has to do so that we can grow, so that we can make a bigger difference in this community. But we can't help but feel sometimes that what we do always has so many obstacles, and many times when we plan, there are so many unplanned disruptions. I think it's safe to say that the pandemic is one of the biggest unplanned disruptions we've we've experienced in our lives, or perhaps at least for a very long time. Now, friends, today as we look at the book of Haggai, I believe that God has an important message for us—a message of encouragement to those of us who are feeling discouraged, tired, and perhaps some of us are even asking this question: How can we not lose hope as we serve the Lord? Now it's important that as we look into the scripture, we actually see that、uh, there's four messages. So let me just recap for all of us. You know that you've already gone through three messages, but in chapters one verses,、uh, chapters one verses one to fifteen, it's been a harsh message. It was a message that reminded them that you know you seem to care more about your own comfort than the rebuilding of God's temple. It was a call to action, and thankfully,、uh, Zerubbabel. Uh, Joshua and the people responded. Now there is another one. The second message was a message of healing, comforting those that looked to the past, 想当年 and felt that you know, wow, those days were better than the days of the for, the present. But God reminded them that the latter glory will be greater than the former. The third was a holy message, reminding us that while it's important to build God's temple or even for us to build God's church. 
Even more important, God says he cares about our hands. Holy hands and pure hearts matter to God. And today, I believe that God wants to give us a hopeful message. A hopeful message, especially in times like this. Now, it's unique, actually. This final message here has three things that make it very special compared to the other three. First, it's the shortest. So when Pastor So gave it to me, I was like, wow, three verses. What am I going to speak about? But as I look deeper, there's just so much to dig into in this message. Second is the second prophecy on the same day. December 18th, 520 BC, there were two messages, not one. We got the message in chapter 2, verses 10 to 19 as well as right now we get it. Sorry, the, the verses here are wrong. Chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. Now that said, the last thing is it's unique in the sense that all the others were addressed to more than one individual. In fact, they were more of a community message. But here in the final message, it's addressed specifically to Zerubbabel. Whereas others weren't, this one is addressed to one individual. The question is, why him? Why is such a special, unique message for this individual? I think when we realize his position as governor, as well as his family background, we'll start to realize why God wanted to speak a message specifically to him, but a message that also impacts all of us today. Now, a little context about Zerubbabel. He found himself in actually very discouraging circumstances. Remember, they're exiled many years ago, and now even 18 years ago when they came back, not everyone came back, right? Not all of the Israelites came back uh, to the Promised Land. Only about 50,000 returned under Cyrus's permission. That said, they're not their own nation. They're still under the rule of Persia, and they're surrounded by hostile neighbors who did not like Israel. The Jews, in fact, when they came back, they were a little bit unsure of themselves too. They were more concerned of their own comfort, their own uh, prosperity than with the things of God. And although they started to respond and we started to see some encouraging action happening even in chapter 1, we realized that even in chapter 2, Haggai is still reminding them that, you see, although outward, outwardly they look religious, Inwardly, there was still a problem because their hearts were still not completely right before God. And so we see the spiritual challenge, but we also see the physical challenge because the walls of Jerusalem were still down, the city was still vulnerable, and in the midst of all these circumstances, Zerubbabel was called to lead the people to rebuild God's temple. So it would have been very natural for him to feel discouraged, to feel overwhelmed, even though he knew what to do. But you know, that said today, as we look into the fourth message in Haggai, where God speaks directly to Zerubbabel, importantly, I believe these implications impact you and I today too. It's a message of hope, and I pray that it gives you a great encouragement today from God's word. Let's pray and let's prepare our hearts for the rest of this sermon. Father, we just ask that you speak to us speak directly to our discouraged and tired hearts. I pray that you would lift us up through your word because God, you are a faithful God and we look to you and we turn to your word today. We ask you to open our spiritual eyes and ears to see your glory and to hear words of hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, how can we not lose hope? as we serve the Lord, especially as a church, you know, we know what we should be doing, but sometimes that's just not how we feel. We feel very discouraged. We feel tired. And that's an important question as we look at Zerubbabel as a leader, the overwhelming circumstances that he faces and what God says to him directly. Look at the words in chapter 2, verses 20 to 22. Over here, I'm just going to read it one more time. It says, the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai, on the same day, 24th day of the month, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the kingdoms, the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdom of nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders shall go down, everyone by the sword of his brother. 
Now, friends, if you know the Bible and if you've been reading and following along the past few weeks, here God repeats the phrase again, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. Now, the first time God uses this phrase, God was saying he's going to shake the heavens so that all the treasures will come in. That God is saying Israel will know no lack as we serve God. As we finish the work of God, God provides abundantly. But this second usage is a little bit different in how he phrases it and how he explains it here, right? Here he uses it to highlight that God was going to overthrow the kingdoms of this world. In other words, in the midst of all this overwhelming circumstances that Zerubbabel was facing, God reminds him, and we need this reminder too, that God is sovereign. God is still very much in control. God cannot be shaken. In fact, he does the shaking, right? Note the repetition here in the personal pronoun. You see all the eyes in verses, chapter, verses 20 to 23. It says, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots. I will take you. I will make you. I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. A simple way of saying this is, Zerubbabel, I know what I'm doing. I'm completely in control because I am a sovereign God. In fact, throughout scripture, we see, especially in the book of Haggai, this phrase, this characterization, this name of God, which is the Lord of hosts. It's repeated so many times, all to drive home one point, that the Lord is sovereign, the Lord is in control. And may I argue from these verses, he's saying that he has a track record to prove it. Now, let me elaborate on this idea of track record. Some of you perhaps have been watching the Olympics, and you know, no matter who you're cheering or no matter which commentator you're listening to, as they're talking about these um, competitors, they always talk about one thing. They talk about the individual's track record, their past, what they've achieved, their personal best, who they, who they defeated in the past, and their chances of winning. So an example would be Yu Meng Yu, our uh, table tennis representative. Every single individual that she was fighting, the commentators would say, oh, these people are ranked way higher than her. In fact, she's world ranking number 47. And the last one that she won, she was fighting against someone who's a world ranking of 10. Now, because of the track record, the commentators would say if she won, everyone would be surprised. Everyone would go, wow, you know, we didn't expect that because her track record is she should be beaten by this person who's more experienced, who's won more matches than her. And when she lost, the commentators would say, well, she did a good job, but you know, that was to be expected based on her track record. Well, if we speak of track records, we have the Bible as God's track record here. Especially in the Old Testament, we see how God describes all of his doings, all of his works. God has a 100% perfect track record when it comes to defeating his enemies. God says here in the scripture that I'm about to destroy the strength of these kingdoms, to overthrow the chariots, the riders, and even to cause everyone to be destroyed by the sword of his brother. Now, in the Persian Empire, chariots represented strength. You know, it's something to boast about. And here God's saying, you know what? The strongest of the Persian Empire is going to be defeated by me. They are no match for our Lord. But it also seems to be alluding, I feel, to a biblical story that you and I are familiar with and very much the Jews were familiar with. When's the other time that we heard of chariots being overthrown by God? I think one picture that might come to our mind, especially from Sunday school, is that of Exodus chapter 14, where the Egyptian army, the chariots, the horsemen of Egypt, were, over, were overwhelmed by God, were defeated by God as Israel led, uh, God led Israel through the Red Sea. Similarly, when we talk about every brother uh, taking down brothers by their own sword, we think of another story, actually, of the 300 of Gideon as they go into battle and suddenly God fights their battle for them. Judges chapter 7 verses 22 over here says, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. Friends, God here is reminding Zerubbabel of his might, of his track record, that God is sovereign 
yesterday, today, and forever, God is reminding Zerubbabel that just as he defeated his enemies before, he shall do so again because our God, like I said, has a perfect track record. He has never failed and he will never fail, not only Zerubbabel, but us as well. I like what the psalmist says. I like this description. And even as I was reading scripture, this verse popped into my mind. It says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Friends, our God is sovereign, but the question is, who are we trusting today? Are we trusting more of our programs, of our possessions, or even the people around us more than the Lord of hosts? Here I think Zerubbabel is being reminded that the God who goes before him is with him and will help him all the way because he is the Lord of hosts, he is sovereign, he is mighty, and he's in complete control. Now, I like this newspaper article I read. Um, I saw it online, and it says this local or Oregon newspaper uh, in the U.S. said this. It was a typo error, and the typo error was corrected on the next day. It says, the title of a first Christian church program in last week's paper was written as, Our God Resigns. And it says, sorry, the actual title is, Our God Reigns. Friends, just one letter. One letter and it made all the difference, right? Between our God resigning and our God reigning. But as much as this is a little bit humorous, the question is, do we live like our God reigns? Or we, do we live as if our God has resigned? That our God is not with us. That our God is not faithful. Friends, we need to be like Jeremiah, who in spite of his circumstances, was able to trust God and proclaim our Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Friends, today I want us to trust and be reminded that we can trust God's perfect track record. He's sovereign. He knows what he's doing. But perhaps sometimes it's not God's track record that we're struggling with, right? Right? We trust God. We say, God, we know you're mighty. The problem is not God. We say, the problem is us. We look at ourselves and we think of our own track record. And we say, God, how could you use someone like me? Especially some of us, maybe we've served in church for a long time. And over periods of time, sometimes we fall, we make mistakes, we mess up. And we start to go, God, with my track record, how could you ever use me to do your mighty works? We don't have a great track record, and deep down we think God will never use us again. And that's why verse 23 is so significant, it's so important, so precious to Zerubbabel, because he is not only a God who is sovereign, he is a God who restores. He's a God who can restore us, brothers and sisters. Let's look at verse 23 and see what that says again. It says, on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, many things are worth discussing here, but let me bring our attention to one very significant phrase that's mind-blowing in its implications. Here, God says to Zerubbabel that I will make you like a signet ring. Now, the first time it shows up in the Bible, actually, it kind of gives us a feel of what a signet ring uh, really symbolizes. It's shown up in, in the uh, book of Gen Genesis, chapter 41, where Pharaoh gives Joseph, the Egyptian Pharaoh gives Joseph his signet ring, and in doing so, grants him power and authority. Outside of the king, Joseph was to be respected, to be exalted among the people. In other words, this signet ring imagery seems to be a confirmation by God that he is exalting Zerubbabel to a position of authority. Perhaps that's one way to understand it, that God's saying, hey, I'm giving you authority and power. But in light of something, in light of Zerubbabel's track record, or more specifically, his family's track record, it's even more significant because when we look at the track record of Zerubbabel, we start to go back in his lineage, in his past, and we start to see that he is traced back 
to the last king of Judah, the one that was conquered. And in fact, of his grandfather, it was said here in Jeremiah, as I live, declares the Lord, though Kononiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would tear you off and give you into the hands of those who seek your life. To Zerubbabel's grandfather, who was like a signet ring, this repeated phrase, he says, I'm going to cast you off. I'm going to tear you off and give you to whoever wants you, who wants to seek your life. And in fact, later on, it goes on to say in verse 30, none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. Simply put, God says, because of your evilness, because of your unfaithfulness, your offspring will not be part of this Davidic lineage of blessing. And that was his track record. Zerubbabel had this in his history. He was saddled with a name that had been condemned by God because of his grandfather's unfaithfulness. Can you imagine how he lived his life at that time? God's people, how they looked at Zerubbabel, the whispers, the stares, the shame involved with being of this cursed line, the judgment that he would feel day to day. But now as God in verse 23 of Haggai chapter 2, he declares that he is like a signet ring once again. You know what God is doing here? He's actually doing three things. And I think we can see this very clearly. He's reversing the judgment of the condemned line of Kaniah, his grandfather. He's reinstating the honor of Zerubbabel's family before the Jewish people. No longer did he have to live in shame and dishonor. And lastly, as an individual, he was being restored. Zerubbabel was being restored back to this Davidic lineage. So through Zerubbabel, we see something that God does, which is mind-blowing. God shows that he can give a new name, new hope to people with a bad name, with a bad track record. God can do the same thing to us today as he boldly declares through Paul in 2 Corinthians, right? You know this verse. It's very familiar. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, the new has come. Friends, our God is a God who can restore us no matter how ugly our past so we see here that God is comforting, he's encouraging Zerubbabel that God himself is sovereign and that he's willing and able to restore him and to give him hope in the midst of hopelessness. This is our God, you see. But we'd be mistaken, friends, to conclude that the point of all this is to say that he's going to exalt Zerubbabel and he's going to enable him to conquer all his enemies and rule as king. Because historically, that's not what we see. There is no record of Zerubbabel ever ruling later on as a king. Nor do we see that the Israelites conquered all their enemies at that time. And while there was some partial fulfillment found in the fact that Zerubbabel helped complete the rebuilding of the temple, it seems that Zerubbabel was part of a greater story, a bigger picture, so to speak. Several words tell us that it's actually a greater picture that's being depicted here in verse 23. And let's just look at a few of them together. The first words that are very important here are the words, on that day. Now, when God says on that day, he says he's going to shake the heavens. This phrase is used up several times throughout the Bible to describe some kind of future eschatological event, and sometimes even to describe end times. Now, we know that for a fact, if it was the shaking of heavens, it didn't seem to happen in Zerubbabel's time because the enemies were still there. They were still under Persian rule. That day, it seems, involves Zerubbabel, but it goes way beyond that. Now, the second word that helps us to realize that this is not just about Zerubbabel and his ruling is the word servant. God calls him here a servant my servant. Now clearly to be a servant of the Lord Most High is a great honor. 
to be a servant of the Lord of hosts. Wow, that's amazing. And several individuals in the Bible share this title, most significantly of all being one of his ancestors, King David. Now, we already know that now God is saying, you are like a signet ring. I'm placing you back into this Davidic lineage. So Zerubbabel has been restored to the line of the thrones of David or the kingship in David's lines. And as we go on, as we fast forward all the way to the New Testament, we know where this lineage goes to, right? It ultimately goes to the greatest servant of all, our servant king, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, we see that Zerubbabel is mentioned here in Matthew chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. He's part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And that's amazing. I don't think that at that time, Zerubbabel could have imagined that this would be happening. But the thing is, here he's not just a servant. God makes it clear why he chose, why he is a part of God's kingdom. And that word actually is the word chosen. Sorry, I revealed it a little early. But that said, over here, it leads us to this final description of Zerubbabel. You see, he's a signet ring, he's a servant, and he's also chosen by the Lord. In fact, over here, we start to see that God has chosen Zerubbabel, and I'd argue that he's also chosen us for his purposes. To be chosen by the Lord is a high honor, and it gives reassurance to Zerubbabel that God is with him. But it also meant that God's purposes are being worked out through him. We know that because now we know that through him, the Messiah comes. The savior of the world comes through this lineage. It worked out even more than he could imagine. Now, I highly doubt Zerubbabel would have thought that. But look at the fulfillment of God's promises. It actually came in stages, right? If you start to see, God fulfilled it part by part. The first part is a partial fulfillment where Zerubbabel successfully leads them to rebuild the temple in a couple of years. The second greater fulfillment is Jesus. Jesus adds that latter glory as that promise of a temple that cannot be destroyed. And may I dare say that we can fast forward even to beyond us, that Revelation tells us of an even greater fulfillment that's going to happen on that day when the Lord comes again. There will be no more need of a temple because Revelation tells us God himself is the temple. You see, importantly here, we're starting to see why God spoke to Zerubbabel. He had chosen Zerubbabel for his purposes to complete his plans. And God has chosen not just Zerubbabel, but us as well for his purposes. Because just like Zerubbabel, you and I have responded to Jesus Christ. And those of us who say that we trust in him, First Peter tells us a new identity, right? He says we are a chosen race. We are chosen now. We're a holy nation. And there's a purpose behind that, right? Over here at the end of this verse, it says, our purpose is to declare his glory to the nations. In fact, friends, the mind-blowing fact is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, talks about God choosing us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Friends, we are a chosen people. We're chosen for his purposes. There's a plan and purpose in our lives that God is working out. Sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes we don't know what it is. But that's our identity, but it also is our life purpose. As God's chosen people, we can trust that God is sovereign in our lives, that we are restored, we are renewed by the blood of the Lamb, and also now we can live out our lives with purpose and meaning. Sometimes even when we don't feel it, we have to be reminded that God has a purpose in our lives. Now, going back to the question that we asked at the very beginning, how can we not lose hope as we serve the Lord? Let me just bring it to a personal sharing first. Surveys out there differ on this, but I can vouch at least for me and for a lot of the pastors around me that, you know, it says that 70% of pastors constantly fight depression and over 80% of pastors and their wives feel discouraged in their work at one time or another. 
Now, recently, my wife had a very honest conversation with me, and when she shared this, I was a little bit shocked, actually. She said, you know, when I married you, you told me that being a pastor's wife is not easy and it would take some sacrificing. Uh, I knew that, but I never knew how much sacrificing that would mean. She's listening to this right now, so at least I mentioned it, and it's true. But as she shared this, I realized that, you know, sometimes in life, as we serve, it's not easy. In fact, as I grew up in my, uh, my mother church, my home church, uh, my senior pastor at that time, uh, Pastor So, another Pastor So, not this Pastor So, <laughs> uh, he was once asked in a Bible college among a bunch of seminary students, you know, Pastor So, how often do you feel like giving up? And he answered to the laughter of some, he said, every other week. Now, I don't know why that stuck with me. He said that almost 20 years ago. But I've always remembered this, and I realized that, you know, in life, maybe every other week, sometimes we don't feel great. Every other week, we're like, oh, why is this so hard? We know what we should be doing, but it's not easy. And now, the point is, I'm not trying to say pastors' lives are hard, because all of us are going through different things. I can only speak as a pastor. But as we go through the difficulties and trials in life, how can we not give up? I think in chapter 2, verses 20 to 23, Haggai wants to remind us about our God. Our God is sovereign. He's in control. He knows what he's doing, friends. And even times of, in times of doubt, we can trust him because he has a perfect track record. In fact, sometimes we don't feel worthy. We don't doubt his track record. We doubt ourselves. Then listen to these words that God can restore us. He can renew us. He can lift us up from the darkness. And he can give us hope again. Because let us never forget that he's chosen us for his purposes. Friends, God wants to encourage us today with this word. And even right now as we're recording, it's a huge downpour outside. I know sometimes when we go through life, there's downpours, there's heavy rains, there's storms in our life. But may God sustain us and help us remember that he's sovereign, He restores, and he's chosen us for his purposes. Let's pray. Father, you say that we can come to you, all of us who are burdened, heavy laden, and you give us rest. Father, we also know that you not, not just give us rest, you restore us. You renew us with purpose and hope in our lives. And I pray that God, you help us to always remember that you are that sovereign God. You are in control at every moment of our lives. So we trust in you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.